Hello and welcome to News Click. I am Paranjoy Guha Thakurta in New Delhi. On the 11th of June, journalist Jyotirmoy De was brutally murdered outside the residential complex he lived in, in Mumbai, in broad daylight. De was one of the finest crime reporters in this country. He was known for his investigative reporting. And two weeks after his death, there is considerable speculation as to who were responsible for his death. I have with me here Sachin Kalbag. He is the executive editor of Midday Mumbai, the newspaper for which they used to work. Sachin, thank you so much for coming here. You know, when you look at the circumstances under which they was brutally murdered. What was your reaction when you heard that something like this had happened? And what were the thoughts that went through your head? And why do you think he was targeted? These are the first few questions I want to ask you. Yeah, first of all, I was, uh, I was shocked. I mean, as any editor would be, any colleague of J.D. was, uh, it was completely unbelievable that in a city like Mumbai, an investigative reporter of the stature of uh, J.D. Uh, would be murdered. My first reaction was, uh, oh my God, you know, which story has he done that, you know, that, uh, that culminated in his uh, murder? And uh, the more I think about this, you know, about what stories he has done, uh, what investigative reporting he has done, the more I think about it, and I, th and I think that there could be hundreds of people who could be responsible for this. I mean, he had done various stories on uh, the underworld, uh, police corruption, bureaucratic corruption, the mafias, uh, the Mumbai, apart from being the, being the commercial capital of India, is also, also possibly the mafia capital of India because there are all kinds of mafias. There's a water mafia, there's the sand mafia, there's the oil mafia, there's the adul adulteration mafia. T tell us a little bit of some of these investigative reports that they did, which perhaps, you know, would certainly have antagonized very, very powerful and influential elements within the underworld. Uh, you know, my, uh, that's my point, you know, it's not just the underworld who may have been responsible. Uh, there are, uh, you know, v you know um, there are elements in society in, 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 in Mumbai, uh, you know, whether they are builders, whether they are, you know, people who are engaged in the water trade, whether they are people engaged in the oil trade, you know, they're not necessarily the underworld in the classical sense of uh, the underworld, but uh, they are now, the, 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 these sectors have become so criminalized and the organized crime in these uh, sectors is so rampant that it could be anybody. Recently, he had done several stories on uh, uh, builders, uh, you know, in, you know um, inconsistencies in the in the, uh, uh, the leg you know the legalities of certain buildings. So clearly, there are people that he spoke about openly. Uh, okay, you know, there's been a lot of speculation as to whether it could have been a job which was done even by certain rogue elements within the Mumbai police. And we keep hearing the names of certain individuals. One police person whose name cropped up in this case was that of his assistant commissioner of police, Anil Mahavale. But he himself denies that he has nothing to do with it. Why, did, uh, I mean, what, are the, what are the possibilities that it could be not just the mafia, but elements, corrupt elements within the police department of Mumbai who uh, were unhappy with the kind of investigative reports that they was uh, putting out in your newspaper. Right. You know, uh, the case of uh, Anil Mahabali is very intriguing. Uh, it is intriguing because, you know, since 2007, uh, Anil Mahabali was under the scanner of the Anti-Corruption Bureau of the Mumbai Police. And there has been a report which was published, uh, which was uh, uh, submitted to the Mumbai Police Commissioner as well as to the state government. Uh, on his uh, links with the underworld. I mean, he used to dine and, uh, you know, drink and dine with uh, Hasina Parker, who's the direct sister of uh, Daud Ibrahim, the underworld uh, Don, who's now allegedly in uh, Pakistan. Now, when the Anti-Corruption Bureau of the Mumbai Police has indicted a certain officer, it is incumbent on the, uh, on the, uh, the senior officers to take action against him, or at least uh, investigate him further and you know look into the links but for four years nothing of this sort happened and uh, ACP Mahabule continued uh, in the most uh, you know in quotes lucrative zone of uh, South Mumbai uh, so that created a bit of a uh, 
problem, uh, especially when our other reporter, Tarakan Vivedi, was arrested uh, under yeah. the official it's secret side. Yeah. It's, it's important for you to talk about what happened to Tarakan Vivedi, also known as Akela. Uh, I understand that he uh, wrote reports, even before he joined Midday, about how various kinds of equipment and ammunition that had been purchased by the law enforcement authorities, by the police and by the, the uh, railway police and the Bombay police, had been literally kept uh, in the open where it would rain. And by writing this investigative report, he ended up being arrested, and that too under the Official Secrets Act. How, how did this happen? Uh, Akela had written a story in 2010 about the RPF armory, where you know ex expensive equipment was bought for the protection of the railway uh, uh, railway premises um, by the RPF, and uh, they were rotting in the rain because you know there was a leakage in the roof and where the armory was. And Akela had gone along with a photographer to, uh, to do the story. He wrote that story. The, the photographer published the story, uh, published a picture of the armory being, uh, being the, where the equipment was rotting. And surprisingly, nine months or ten months later, he was arrested under the Official Secrets Act. Now, the letter, the FIR was lodged under Section 447 of the Indian Penal Code, which talks about unlawful entry. But the, when Akela went to give the statement to the, his statement to the police, uh, suddenly and mysteriously this Official Secrets Act was invoked by a senior officer and uh, he was arrested. And uh, as you know, the you know, Official Secrets Act is so draconian that it's very difficult to get bail in, in the lower courts. And, and, and imagine if this is happening in the heart of Mumbai, what kind of message does do, do the rest of the journalistic fraternity get in different parts of the country? You made a right point. I mean, the whole idea of intimidating Akela was not to intimidate Akela alone. The whole idea was to intimidate the media fraternity in general. That if you go, if you fall foul of our uh, interests, then we'll get after you. And this is my fear is that this is the same thing that happened with JD. I mean, JD has had been an investigative reporter for more than two decades, nearly two and a half decades. And uh, it could be that you know he's written so many stories against so many people that any of those people would. Ha, you know, have a grudge against him. You know, tell me a little bit more about Day. You know, he, he was in his mid fifties when he was brutally assassinated. I was told he was a tall person, six feet four inches, but a very, very gentle and a very, very uh, a person who had a lot of warmth towards his colleagues. Tell us a little bit more about the kind of person Day was, not only as a human being but also a, as a professional. I worked very briefly with him in the first, in the early nineties when we actually started our careers together. I was only 21 and he was uh, in his mid-30s at that time. And uh, you know, even at that time he was very quiet. He was this huge six foot four inch guy and our office was very small and he would intimidate everyone, you know, with his, with his stature. And uh, you know, but he would, he, his personality was exactly the opposite of his uh, crime writing. I mean, he would expose people with the arrogance and the aggress aggression of a, of a heavyweight boxer. But uh, in, in the office, while dealing with people, while talking to uh, editors or even copy editors on the news desk, he would be extremely polite and he would or, you know, refer to them as sir or madam. And he would not do this in jest, he would do this very genuinely. I mean, he would call me, I'm, I was 20 years younger to him, and uh, he would call me sir. And you know, so much, he was so quiet about, uh, about various things that people working with him in his next cubicle for four years and five years would not know, you know, who his wife was or, you know, what he was doing, doing during the day. In fact, several people realized after he died that his wife was a former colleague of ours at midday. He was so secretive about even his personal life. So, uh, you know, he would keep quiet. He would, you know, give, you know, keep to his own counsel unless there was a breaking story and it was a big story in which case, you know, both of us used to talk at length. Uh, because there were legal implications involved, there were documentary evidence that we needed. So, but he was very thorough in that. I mean, he would not come to my office and say, I'm doing a story, but I have no leads, I have no sources. He would come in the office and say, this is the 55 page document that I've got against this guy, and uh, let's do this story. So I had the courage of going ahead with the story, because he gave me the courage that he's got the documentary evidence to back it up. If Jay Day's death is not to be in vain, 
if at the end of the day, despite the fact that here was an honest, upright, investigative journalist who sought to expose corruption in high places, who sought, sought to report about the links between the underworld and the police department, about important politicians, about influential business people, builders and so on, if his death is not to be in vain, if there are some important lessons that all of us as journalists, that the media fraternity in India and the world has to learn, what according to you are those important lessons that we all need to learn? I think first we need to, the media fraternity in India needs to be close-knit and fight this menace together. Because right now, you know, with, with the economic boom in the country, uh, the interest, the economic interests of certain sectors has grown so wide and so big that it's, you know, it's actually difficult for a newspaper like Midday, a mid-sized newspaper like Midday, to, to fight it alone. Or uh, in the case of IBN Lokmat, you know, where, when its offices were attacked uh, two years ago, or any, any of the individual journalists in the rural areas or the, uh, the, the so-called B-towns are, are attacked. Uh, what happens is that you know those uh, cases go unnoticed or if they are noticed then after five or six days because of our short attention spans they're off the pages of our own newspaper or, or, our, or our television channels so this should not happen that you know if there are attacks on journalists it should be a concerted continuous effort on part of the journalist organization as well as media houses to continue the fight point number two is that crime reporters and investigative journalists should be aware of the dangers that they are they are, uh, they, they face. I'm, I'm glad you're mentioning the what, you know, if journalists indeed have to face certain dangers, if there are certain occupational hazards, how do they ensure that, you know, there is at least some sort of a protection? Well, firstly, understand the signs. I mean, in the case of J. Day, I, you know, he's, he did not speak to me about any of the threat calls that he may have got, or he did not speak to them about, uh, about the calls with his colleagues in the immediate crime department. But if, if he had received any calls from uh, an interested party, a threat call, maybe threaten his family, threaten him, um, or you know, threaten him with you know, whatever consequences, those signs need to be taken very, very seriously now. I mean, until now, journalists had a very nonchalant attitude about uh, you know, threats, especially crime reporters, when they think that the more you know, threats they get, the more important they are. Uh, that is not the case anymore. J Day's case should be a wake-up call not only to the authorities but also to the media fraternity that there is a clear and present danger on on our lives, especially if we do in so-called inconvenient stories. And the the more we continue, you know, this solidarity, the more we are aware of the dangers, uh, and we are aware of those dangers in time, quickly, then we can approach the correct or the, the right authorities. In, in the case of J-Day, if he, he was doing a story, an investigative story, that I knew would have resulted in his death, I would have told him, don't do that story. Because for me, you are more... Or, or take a number of precautions. Take a number of precautions, you know, because for me, your life is more important because, you know, there than are... The story. Than the story. Because, you know, there are hundred other stories to be done. Thank you very much, Sachin, for talking to Newsclip. Thank you. Thank you.